coming to you from the Star City. This is Scarlet Fever, a daily Nebraskan production. Happy Positive Monday. <laughs> it's Volleyball Monday because we decided to do football yesterday because we're just cool like that. It's Scarlet Fever. Welcome back. It's episode 21. We celebrated 20 anniversary yesterday and we decided just not to acknowledge about it because there's so much doom and gloom we were just like you know what who cares so we're actually gonna care today and we've made it to 20 let's go Danny Brooks here I'm a bomb guard Olivia Davenport hello everybody hey. <laughs> it's it's been a day it's raining it's gloomy it's November 4th Olivia and I were both at basketball before this and we got to hear thousands of screaming kids all day hi <laughs> testament to them i don't think i've ever heard pba louder and it was like half full so i don't know what they had in their drinks their food before they came to lincoln today but they were ready i know that they put something explosive in their water bottles as i got hit with three bottle caps and press row today so that was kind of fun and then their pom-poms are just like hitting me in the hands so whatever we're doing i think we need to like move them two rows away from press row and maybe something will be good there. They just really wanted a t-shirt, you know? I mean, I wanted a t-shirt. <laughs> except, you know, we're, we're not cool enough to get t-shirts and we got to give them to the middle schoolers. Still still a great day for them, though. Yeah, great day. Learned some life skills. Oh, I was, I was very <laughs> enthralled. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to have everybody back. And we got something fun today. It's actually, it's, it's Emma's birthday today. Yay! I know. <laughs> bye bye to your teenage year. I know. I'm not I got ID at the movie theater the other, literally yesterday because I was going to see a movie that was you had to be probably 18, and she was like, "No, you had to be 17." I don't even look 17. Oh, I'm 20. What? I'm yeah. 20, ma'am. This like. Yeah, this summer I took my nanny kids to like our science center in Des Moines and the lady checked my ID because she was like, you have to be 16 or older to be here without a parent. And I was like, I drove them here. Like, <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah, so. All right, enough of this tomfoolery. We got stuff to get to. There was a lot that happened over the weekend that was good for Nebraska. We're going to decide <laughs> not to dwell on the doom and gloom that happened. On Saturday, instead, there were some good things that happened on Friday and Sunday, specifically something that hasn't happened in a long time, Nebraska winning at the UW Fieldhouse. Not only winning, sweeping. sweeping. Yeah. What a game that was. Big My deal. My goodness. That, that's a huge deal. And it's not getting the attention that it should be getting, quite honestly, because, yeah, you think, oh, yeah, Nebraska sweeps, like, hooray. They swept Wisconsin, Wisconsin, a team that has had their number for a decade, pretty much. They didn't win a set in Madison since 2021, first win since 2013. It's a a big deal. I I think it's a huge deal. We talked about how the rivalry between these two teams is like so big and the history between them is crazy last week and I think for Nebraska to go in and dominate the way they did has to be confidence building like to the max for John Cook and his team as we get closer to postseason. Yeah and not wanting to get too far ahead of ourselves but going in and sweeping at Wisconsin and then knowing that the next time you play is at Nebraska and it's really hard to beat a team twice as we know but I feel like I would have to give them a boost for that, too. I can only imagine the chip on the shoulder that's going to be going with oh, uh, with yeah. Coach Kelly's team coming into Devaney in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Devaney is going to be rocking. I saw that little bit they did before the game with Sheffield and John Cook and the like swarm on the court after we won in five, after Nebraska won in five last time they came to Devaney, and I was like, wow, that was such a crazy environment. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. Again this year, it's, it's going to be It'll bonkers. Be exciting. It's going to be bonkers. The flies are going to be bouncing off the wall. The place is going to be packed. That's going to be a crazy weekend in the state of Nebraska for athletics to begin with, and that's just going to be the dessert that everybody's looking forward to after the four course meal. You got, man, you thought you got enough after the the courses from beforehand. Oh, just you wait. This one's going to be a doozy. But this it it was just total domination 
all the way around. There was a couple times where Nebraska looked like they were kind of faltering a little bit, going back on old habits and just letting themselves beat each other. And then they just quickly like, okay, we got to stop this. And then they turned it around. That's We haven't seen a ton of that this year where they've let things snowball and then they decide to punch the snowball in the middle of it and let it explode. Usually that snowball continues to build until it's a giant snowman taller than the than the Capitol building. This time that wasn't the case. They actually deconstructed the snowball. Yeah, I I think it's really a testament to how much emphasis they've put on that this season and uh, not trying not to allow teams to go on runs, but when they do, turning it around. I don't know if you... Um, saw very much but in between most of the points that Wisconsin were scoring coaches and players were like making this hand motion like next point next point because you're not going to win every point like that's just so unrealistic and Wisconsin's going to make good plays it's that game was more about how are you going to rebound from those good plays and take that momentum back and obviously they won in three pretty handily did that with great success Especially when you're playing Wisconsin, you know it's going to be close sets, a close game. Um, obviously, the whole match wasn't very close since they swept, but each set was pretty close. And I feel like they started off and like in the middle, they got close. But Nebraska did a really good job at pulling away at the end, which is something that I think they've been struggling with. But they did a really good job of like, yeah, okay, it's going to be close throughout. But like as they kept going, they pulled away. It took a little bit of time too, and it, and it seemed like Wisconsin was just allowing these runs to continue to fester, and this really wasn't something that we were really expecting going into the game. It felt like okay, this is going to be a real tug of war type game, and it's who's going to be able to make less mistakes and get more balls to the floor. It didn't really feel like it was going to be like a 5-0 run is going to be the difference in this game, but that's exactly what it ended up becoming. It just felt like one of those classic Nebraska master classes. Just so happened to be against Wisconsin. Yeah, it was interesting how those sets ended, like you said, kind of pulled away. And it wasn't, I would say Wisconsin rolled over, but they. I expected a larger fight from them, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, because... How are you going to allow Nebraska to come into your building, Fieldhouse, packed with your fans, and then all of a sudden it's just you lost? You didn't mm-hmm. even win a set. If I if gambling was legal in the state of Nebraska, <laughs> I would put. You'd be a terrible gambler, a, though. <laughs> hey, I have some experience. Um, <laughs> okay. I would put money on the fact that this would have gone more than three sets, and not even necessarily that either team would have played poorly. I just thought it would be more competitive than what it ended up being. And I think it's really interesting because we've talked about how Nebraska, it felt like they kind of pulled away. But if you look, in the second set, they only won by three points, which isn't a huge margin necessarily. But just watching it, it felt like you just could tell that they had so much more control as the game went on. And that second set was really interesting, though, because Nebraska did get out to such a quick start. At one point, they were leading 13-8. to mm-hmm. And then Wisconsin starts figuring it out they rattle off four points in a row nebraska's got to stop to stop it wisconsin actually takes the lead for a while at one point it's i think it was 17 14 that wisconsin was up and then nebraska's got to rally back you got to rally back can't let yourself get in too deep of a hole because wisconsin's too good a team that they will put you away if you let them and they didn't it was one of those games where like the resilience was able to push through for them in a way that they really haven't allowed it to this season because they've been playing from ahead so much. Yeah, and we talked about that, how in some of the games in the past, they get a very large lead and they're able to kind of allow a run and still keep the lead. And I think it was impressive that they were still kind of able to do that with Wisconsin. Granted, they didn't keep the lead the whole time, but they were able to build themselves up enough to where a three or four point run wasn't going to end the game and completely give them no chance. Yeah, and I think sometimes when you watch them, like not just Nebraska, but any team, you can see when the runs start to pile up and like we've said, they kind of start to snowball and you can see it on their faces when they get like just disappointed and they're like kind of out of it. But I don't feel like they ever looked like that. Like even when they got behind or they were making mistakes, they just looked in it. They were like ready to play. 
they were just in the moment. And you could tell there was some concern on the faces, especially in that second set, about how things were going. Mm-hmm. Even at the start, as it went along, too, like it was 17 14, it was 19 16. At one point, Wisconsin was up 21 20. It looked like that they were on the brink of taking the set, like, the, like we all expected it to be. Then Nebraska goes out and wins for the next five set, next five points. Mm-hmm. They just went out and they're like, okay, we're tired of this. Let's get this done. And, and they finished the job. That's really. All there was to it, it did take two set points in you know classic Nebraska fashion because that's what they do. Can't win it on the first one. It's always got to be second at or more. Least. It's always got It's always got to be at least two because they they got to make things just just like the football team and they it's always got to be dramatic. Got to keep them invested just a little bit longer. Um, and they were able to to put it away on that second try. Yeah, and I know in an ideal world you'd win a set. Every, every given set point you have, you take it and you walk away at home. But kind of credit to Wisconsin, you know you're losing. You have a big mountain to climb, and to even try and try and climb that mountain is a little bit impressive. They came back, I think, fought off like maybe three set points in set one, and that was really a good tone setter for them. They obviously carried that into the second set, and Nebraska ultimately taking set two. But when you are able to stop teams from winning a set like immediately on that first set point I think it kind of frustrates that team a little bit and it can build the other team's confidence yeah and I think it even gives more credit to Nebraska that they're able to keep pushing through and get that set point even when Wisconsin goes back to serving and they kind of gain that momentum back it was three of them in that first set of of course Olivia's on it she knows exactly what's going on you're welcome. You're welcome. And then they they actually got it in one in the in the third. They were just they just, it got to a point where they were just rolling. They went on a five zero run to end the game. They were ready Six of the last play. seven. Wisconsin. You could tell Wisconsin was they were tired. It it didn't really look like they were fully in the game as it went along. It's been a little while since they had been in that spot, and they're so used to having domination over Nebraska it's like this is uncharted territory for him yeah well and Sarah Franklin struggled a little bit in the first set I'm pretty sure she had five errors and ended the game with seven so ultimately got a lot better as the game went on and as their rock I don't think she provided as much of a spark as they needed granted she still had 16 kills which is a, like a large number she led the match both teams with kills but She still wasn't doing enough, and I think that's where Nebraska is at the advantage. They have so many players who are going to get kills, and Taylor Lanfair Mm -hmm. stepped up this week, maybe Mm. earning herself a starting spot. She led Nebraska with 13 kills, and then obviously we have Merritt Beeson and Andy Jackson are in the mix. Harper Murray only had six, and typically she's more of an arm that Nebraska relies on, but with Wisconsin, Sarah Franklin is such a huge part of their offense that they needed her to get more than 16 kills if they were going to win this match. And that is just something that I feel like is really impressive for Nebraska. They were able to come in and win this match and still let Sarah Franklin have 16 kills. I do have a Taylor Lanford rebuttal for that, but we'll get to it later. <laughs> okay. That was still really impressive, though. I, it's important that we get to that. Just how much that did make a difference. Because she, actually, she did... Didn't look great to start. She was, and I'm really happy Emily even made this point about it when I was watching the game, is that she was not really putting a lot of heat behind her hits. It was a lot of roll shots, and she was trying to get it over the block, and it's a really tall block. Mm -hmm. Like, Anna Smrek is, what, (laughs) 6'9", 6'10"? Insanely tall. Insanely tall. It, it doesn't even make any sense, and Landfair is just trying to tip it over. Like that's not something you can do. And eventually, she picked it up and she started firing on all cylinders, and that's what got her her 13 kills. But at the start, it didn't look fantastic from her, and then eventually, she picked it up, which was good to see. And I think that's something we've been seeing from her a lot is slower off-speed shots. And John Cook, I've said this before, I know I have, but he's talked about how when everything's going right for her, she she can do things he's never seen before. And I don't feel like we've reached that point where I'm starting to see things that I, I've never seen before from other players. Like, I want to see her jump as high as she can. I want to see her swing super fast. I want to see how high of a contact point she has. And I don't feel like she's created that 
And I don't know if that's chemistry with Bergen Riley as much or just confidence and getting acclimated with Nebraska and everything. But she hasn't, I don't think, like broke out of that yet and kind of started to do things he says she can do. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential that we still haven't seen. And I feel like there's going to be just that one game eventually where all of a sudden like everything clicks and she's just going to go and everybody's going to be like, wow. Like where, we, yeah, <laughs> we have like not seen this all season. But something I thought was really interesting about Nebraska's kills were was, I think the announcer said it throughout the game, but they ne- not none of them had like a super high amount of kills necessarily. But he said like they're getting it done efficiently for the most part. Like I don't know, I thought that was a really good point because yeah, Harper like Harper Murray, Andy Jackson didn't have a huge number, but I feel like a lot of their kills like they were just getting it down. Scott did a good job at stopping. Andy mm-hmm. on yeah. Friday. Incredible job. They Their did a great blocks. job. That yeah. had to be in the scouting report. And it's weird that nobody else has been able to do it until this point. Now, mm-hmm. granted, the caliber that Nebraska has been playing in conference play so far hasn't been fantastic, save Purdue. And even teams like Stanford and Louisville didn't really have a ton to prepare for with Andy Jackson. But Wisconsin has. They've had two and a half months to prepare for Andy Jackson, and they're going to see her again in three weeks. It was pretty Im- impressive that they were able to slow her down as much as they did, especially from CC Crawford. I thought she had a good night on the block. Yeah. yeah, huge night for Wisconsin up front. And again, we knew their block was going to be big. We knew they were a physical team, and that was something that Nebraska was going to have to overcome. But shutting Andy Jackson down to a 118 hitting percentage is something we have not seen yet this season. She took two, three games off with that lower body injury, and she still is second now in the Big Ten in hitting percentage, and this is the primary reason I think she dropped from one to two is because they were able to hold her under 200, which we have not seen before from really any Big Ten teams. Yeah, It was quite impressive to see her slow down but another thing too that I think we haven't mentioned yet and this kind of ties back into Taylor Landfair who had herself a breakout game is that she wasn't even starting Olivia Mount got the start so they went back to the the two um the two defensive lineup the 5-2 which isn't really a thing but I'm gonna call it a thing (laughs) um where they started Rodriguez and then another defensive specialist. We haven't really seen that that this year. We saw a lot of it last year with Laney Chillboy, but so far this year, John Cook's been going with the offensive attack. And this time around, that wasn't really the case. And then you fast forward into Sunday, which we'll get to eventually, but reverts back to that. And I wonder if this lineup construction is still going to be a point of just maneuvering and there's just not going to be a ton of consistency going down the stretch yeah and that's a really good point with the defensive specialist point like side of things because we see Merritt Beeson now getting a few extra plays in that back row she actually had the set one ending kill from the back row so that's taking away time from Lainey Choboy and Olivia Malk's position has kind of been defined as the defensive specialist for the opposite outside that is opposite Harper Murray um it is interesting, though, that he started with her in the back row instead of rotating. Typically, he likes to rotate Harper into the front row so she can be in the front for three rotations at the beginning of the game. But I am really interested to see how, moving forward, Lainey Choboy's playing time is affected as they need to start using Merritt Beeson more in the back row. Choboy did finish with nine digs, though. So she, say- she did get a good amount of good chunk of time. She had a really good Friday. night, I thought, on Friday and on Sunday. I think she ended up with... She had four on, on yeah. Sunday. But still, like I feel like we saw a lot from her against Wisconsin. Well, and a statistical thing, I think that she... A non-statistical thing, excuse me, brings to the floor is like her energy. Mm-hmm. She's fired up. She's always pushing people around. She's spinning in circles. She's always on the floor. And that's something you can't really coach. Like You can ask people, like, come on, guys, come on. But that, that's just something that's special about her. Like You're not seeing Olivia Malk running around like crazy. you know. And that's what makes them so good in their own ways but is Merritt's offensive does that outweigh the energy that Laney's going to maybe bring or is that Laney's energy so imperative to the success of this team that they're willing to sacrifice a couple of swings from Merritt in the back row 
We should note that Olivia is incredibly stoic, and you never see a smile crack on her <laughs> face. It just doesn't happen. Joe Boy's really fun to watch with her energy. Like it's really, it's really cool to see. I think she's rubbed off on Andy Jackson a mm-hmm. little bit. The hair flipping isn't there as much this year, but she loves to go stone cold face, especially in the uh, Illinois game where she let out a exp- let's expletive go at towards the end <laughs> of the game. Which was quite fun to see. We really hadn't <laughs> seen that kind of energy from her this year. But I think that's kind of starting to rub off a little bit. But you make a good point. How How is Chill Boy's playing time going to be affected? Because it's been reduced a ton this year. And that's going to be something to watch going down the stretch. And even more so with apparently Merritt Beeson's going to be playing back there a little bit more too. I was going to say, bringing it back to personalities, can we talk about the Harper Murray stare down? I was like, oh. yeah, no, I I could like feel it. Like I got a, I was like, yes. oh my gosh, like if I was there and I'm not a confrontation person, no. so, but I, I ate it up. I was like, yes, girl. The intensity, because I was like, I love it when Rebecca Alec does that too. Yes. And so to see Harper Murray kind of like really get into that. And I think it just showed how much, how into the game they were at that point. Like, yeah, try again next time. Mm-hmm. You know, like it was just so. It was fun. And I love Merritt Beeson being the mom, like, waving home for being like, stop, stop. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're going to get us in trouble, stop. <laughs> right. We don't yeah. need anything getting out of hand here, ladies. Yeah. Yeah. That's just the mama bear mentality, mm-hmm. ain't it? Captain Merritt. Captain Merritt. All right. <laughs> Let's transition to Sunday's game for a little bit. 3-0 win over Northwestern. It was your classic beating up on the bottom of the barrel team. That's exactly what they needed. Um, but strangely enough... The hitting distribution for Nebraska was kind of all over the place. There wasn't really one dominant force in that game. And they had another lower hitting day. Same deal against Wisconsin, which should mention kept him under 100 to an 094. Pretty dang impressive that they kept him to 094. But yeah, Nebraska did a little bit better against Northwestern, but it didn't seem like it was just get the ball to this person, get the ball to this person. This is what we need. It was kind of, let's get everyone going in this game. Anytime you can win a game and sweep, and Harper Murray only has four kills, and then your other outside, Taylor Lampere has six, and I guess Lindsey Krause had one coming in late in that third set. So 11 kills between three outsides. Anytime that can happen is very successful in my opinion because outsides are swinging a lot you're seeing them get out of system balls in system balls balls way off the court and they're getting a lot of swings so when yes it's maybe disappointing for harper or or taylor maybe they wanted more kills but you're still coming out on top and you're still sweeping and that was a good game they played two days prior a very intense defensive game so then they get to come to northwestern and maybe take some of the pressure off of those outsides and get those middles and merit involved a little bit more I just think it's very telling of again how dispersed of an offense this Nebraska team is yeah and I like the type of mentality that is like being able to give something to everybody like Nebraska has so much depth and to not use it I don't want to say is like a waste but being able to use it is such a blessing and just being able to show it off and if you don't have to use your starters the whole game then you can give some to more people. And Bergen Riley got four kills. Yeah. I love when, yeah. It's one of my favorite things ever it's when she gets so involved on the offense because how are you going to have, okay, let's Harper, Merritt, both middle. So that's like four attackers. And then you just add yourself into the mix. Like you're undefendable. Like who, how is the middle blocker going to know where to go if she gets herself involved? And it just, it brings a whole nother level of excitement. I think the other players just get so excited to see it. And I know Merritt said one time, like, you guys don't get, like, the audience, you guys don't get to see her swing and attack that much, but we see it a lot in practice. But for the audience, it just is so exciting and fun mm-hmm. because it's not something they're used to seeing. Like, okay, yeah, Harper Murray kills really exciting, but how about we get our setter involved? And I think it just amplifies the Devaney center when it happens. Yeah, and I think it adds another layer to the offense and just makes them that much harder. It makes them... I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like unpredictable. Like you just, how are you supposed to defend that? We fail to remember that she was an outside in high school. Mm-hmm. And a, and a I think good we talked one. about that one time. Yeah. Favor fact. And a good one mm-hmm. at that. Like it was hard to defend her yeah. a, as an outside. So that's why it's like use her. 
I know. In high school, she sat for one year. Mm -hmm. And granted, she probably sat at club like her entirety of her high school. But in her high school season, she swung outside because her sister was a setter. And I think that's so cool and fun. And it just really makes her versatile. She knows how to read a defense. Mm -hmm. She knows what spots are open. And I also think that's probably helped her setter brain IQ if you will because she's able to like okay take a quick look across the net this person looks out of position let's give it to Harper Murray she's got a one-on-one boom kill Mm -hmm. you know yeah just I dig it adds more (laughs) dimension thank you thank you thank you but that that was definitely the game no thanks that was definitely the game that they needed um especially after a hard-fought game against Wisconsin even though it was a sweep it was still good to have like a game on the road, especially, where you could just go in and feel like, okay, we got this. And they went and they did it. Yeah. I think that's good practice, too, for what's to come. You know, they're heading to the West Coast this weekend. And those are going to be some tougher games. Oregon and Washington are both going to give them a run for their money. Oregon's not ranked, but they have a chance to be towards the end. And Washington just upset somebody good. <laughs> Let me know who. Um, Oregon is ranked number 12. Oh, well, this is wrong then. <laughs> what are you looking at? <laughs> the schedule. Oh, well, they don't update the rankings oh. until after the game. That's stupid. Well, I don't make the rules. <laughs> so, Oregon is ranked. I knew it. I was really confused <laughs> when I was looking at this. I was like, I'm pretty sure they should be, but whatever. Um, so, another ranked matchup. And then Washington was ranked. They fell out. Didn't they have the top 25? They're, yeah. I, they're, they're second, the second out, out. Second out. So another good team, and that's going to be an even tougher test as they're going to play a Thursday, Saturday again. But yeah, Washington beat Oregon in five sets at home. Oregon, see, it was up there somehow. <laughs> um, it all connects. Yeah, all somehow, some so way. <laughs> but uh, what am I even saying? I don't know. That's fine. They're traveling. It's going to be tough, but this was a good prep. <laughs> yeah, and kind of talking about those rankings, Danny and I were looking earlier, and Nebraska only got 11 votes. No. Yeah. For first place. For first place. Only 11? Only 11. Well, Pitt's, I'm 12. Pitt Make got me 12. 49. I don't, That's I don't... it. I just don't. Thank you. Who was Pitt playing? Please, read me their schedule right now. <laughs> All right, fine. But but anyway, before we get to who Sorry, Pitt, you skipped ahead a little bit. Before we get to who Pitt is playing, I wanted to pose this. What was the most impressive thing from Friday's game that you can take away from and be like, okay, this is something that they can ride on for the rest of the season? I mean, you go first. Oh, honestly, I feel like this is going to sound cliche, but their energy and the ability to like go out ahead and yeah maybe they're going to lose it a little in the middle but then end up coming back I think I know we're not supposed to bring be bringing football into this but that's something that the football team could like take a few hints on um mm, taking shots I'm just saying Can't defend themselves <laughs> man um but I think it's really cool to be able to see them get ahead and then kind of get reality checked in the middle and still come out with the win and I think that's something that they can carry on they know they can do it they swept with it so I'm gonna maybe go a little bit bigger picture here but they were able to walk into a sold out arena against a team that has pretty much had their number that's a rivalry that Mm -hmm. goes way back and they were able to go in they were able to sweep and they were able to do it in like a well dispersed offensive way but I just think that this moving forward you're gonna travel for the postseason we're going to the KFC Yum Center in Louisville tasty um shall they get past regionals and everything. But I think that was a really good test for that because you're going to go to sold-out arenas for other teams as well. And so to go to the field house to make that dominant of a performance on the road was just what was most impressive to me. I was particularly impressed by how well they held held their own on defense. The fact that they got Anasmerich hitting negative, the fact that Sarah Franklin hit under 200 was very impressive on fifty on almost fifty swings, by the way, mm-hmm. which Holy is wrap forty nine attempts. Yeah, that that is bonkers. Um, and Smirka the next closest with twenty seven. So it was clearly a a uh, let's feed one person type of Thanksgiving for Wisconsin. But they were able to to hold their own. They they recorded ten blocks. Rebecca Alec went off with seven. They were digging out of their minds. The energy was there. On the defensive side of the ball, I felt really good 
about them. I'm less concerned about their hitting numbers because I know it will come with time. And there's some things that they still need to get figured out. But on the receiving end, when they're trying to stop balls, it's improved a lot, especially from when they were playing teams like Purdue and Michigan that were just kind of having their way with them a little bit. This feels like, okay, now they went up against a top 10 team who they have just struggled against for years, and they went in and showed him who's boss. I would like to piggyback. I think defense in their gym is just so highlighted and so prioritized and so with offense is going to come with time people are going to have off games and that's just kind of how it is people are going to key in on players like Wisconsin did with Andy Jackson not allow her to have as as good of a night as she could have or has in the past but defense is something you can like be super consistent on and it can be frustrating sometimes when you have an off night uh, but as a defender it's more it's more just a mindset you get gritty you get down you refuse to let balls hit the floor and that's something I think this Nebraska team has just it's just the standard at this point where Lanny Chobo is diving into chairs Harper Murray is diving into chairs I've been so impressed with there's no I want to go dive in a chair <laughs> there's nobody who's just gonna be like okay yeah and everyone wants the ball you we rarely, I feel like, see communication errors in the back row from Nebraska. More often than not, the communication errors happen up top. For whatever reason, Andy Jackson's usually the scapegoat for that. <laughs> I don't know why it's always her, but it always seems like when something goes wrong there, it's either her or it's Lady Chopoy. So there's also that. So the last so I said I was gonna refute Taylor Landfair a little bit here. Because she also she didn't play super well against Northwestern. I said the same. I again. I know we're trying our best to not bring football into this, but I said this. <laughs> this Second is, time we're bringing. This it's is the just Nebraska the, for crying out loud. Yeah, it, <laughs> but this is the Nebraska track record, and it kind of carries over to things. I have a hard time believing in something until I see it for a consistent amount of time, and that's more what I'm looking for out of Taylor Lanfair and Lindsey Krause, specifically Lanfair, because it looks like she is. Barring something crazy happening, looks like she's going to be given more lead to being the starter at that spot. So I just want to see consistent performances strung together. She came off the bench against Wisconsin, put up 13, 13 kills. Cool. I have a feeling also that Mount got the start there because of the fact that she's been serving out of her minds and Cook wanted her in the serving rotation to get the game going, especially towards the top of it to help set the tone there, which is. That's part of what I think it is because Landfair gets subbed out for serving. But I, I want to see Landfair string together a couple performances in a row where she's got the confidence and is putting up the numbers for it and is not making not making the wrong decision. Like the roll shot she was making to start, yeah, they might have looked good in, in her mind, but you're doing them in <laughs> against the wrong people. Like some, you have to use some situational awareness to be like, okay, this is what we got to be doing here. Let me use this against somebody else because I know it's going to work against yeah. them. Well, and typically an off speed's only going to work after you've been hammering the ball down. The and she throat. wasn't, though. And That's the problem. Yeah. If you start with an off speed, I just don't really think it's going to catch defenses as off guard as it would as you're hammering shots down the line. Hard cross court. Oh, let's throw in a roll shot here. Instead, you're going to go roll shot, roll shot, roll shot. Well, now, and then. The block is in the way, so you don't even know if you can hammer a shot down the line yet because all you've done is go over the block, and you're going to get blocked. That's It's just how it is, and you have to hope that your team's there to cover your shot. But you have to test the waters and to wait that long to do that. I feel like she kind of got lucky that it worked out the way that it did. But I understand what you're saying with consistency. I feel like she's one of the players... If it was 26-25 in the national championship of the fifth set, I would be like... That's a long extra right, set. I, My I, goodness. This is the drama, okay? 26-25 is to, crazy. I would go to Harper Murray. I'd go to Merritt Beeson. I'd go to the middle before I would go to Landfair. I'd want Bergen Riley to set just about anyone but her just because of the inconsistency she's had the beginning of this season. Would you trust Lexi Rodriguez before Taylor? Hey, Lanfair? did you see that free ball kill though? <laughs> I did see <laughs> did that. Did you see that? So maybe. And I think <laughs> she I think she has a lot of potential and I think it just has to be doing with comfort and breaking into this Nebraska culture. They're such a tight knit group. There's not you know, 
John Cook plays mostly everybody. Sky Pierce, the only one that really hasn't. And well, Maisie. Yeah, and Maisie. But they're all super tight. You know, they we see them on TikTok, Instagram. So to break into that, I'm sure, is a little bit difficult. But we're we're kind of past that now. Like you, we should be seeing some higher performances from her, in my opinion. Yeah. No, I Echo. agree. I think this. Um, they're like between her and Krause, it's kind of we've talked about it all season. It's been kind of this back and forth. It's not really sure who's gonna be out there, who's gonna go. You see them getting pulled in the middle. So I just I don't know. I think it's been kind of an interesting, tricky spot, and I have I don't feel more confident in it than I did earlier in the season. It'll be something to watch this weekend as well because they're they're gonna need it. They're going into hostile environments. Washington sold out for the first time in a long time. At, for their game on Saturday, Oregon's always a tough place to play. It doesn't matter what sport it is. It's always a tough place to go. It's a ranked team that's had an up-and-down year, but for the most part, they've been pretty consistent. And by the way, you got to go travel to Pacific Northwest. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, for the first time ever in the Big Ten, you got to head haul your cookies to <laughs> the northwestern states of the country. I want some brownies instead. <laughs> but yeah, you got to go to Eugene. you got to go to Seattle. Like, but th- funny enough, this is actually the trip that they've most been looking forward to, according to Volleyball Media Days over the summer. <laughs> but they're going to have to go out and show that they can handle the travel. Like This isn't really something they've had to deal with a ton this year. They Yeah, they've had to go to Dallas. Yeah, they've had to go to Louisville. This is something totally different. This is going to the Pacific Northwest, two time zones. You have to deal with the elevation there as well. Uh, let's talk about the time zone. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to be watching this on record yeah. games because <laughs> I won't like if these games go more than three sets, it's getting past 11 o'clock at night. I don't yeah. understand like the adjustment their bodies are going to have to make in such a quick amount of time. I I don't know. I'm sure John Cook's got some magic <laughs> that he's going to do, their curfew, whatever fuel they're going to have, but that's crazy 9 p.m on thursday 9 30 p.m on saturday and then yeah. and then get this after that when they come home the next game they play at home eight o'clock Ugh. against minnesota oh my eight o'clock yep and that's like we've kind of talked about this but i don't know if we have but there's been a lot of talk about conference realignment and how only football has really been taken into consideration when it comes to it like volleyball soccer like all these other like they're being put through the ringer when it comes to the conference realignment. Like, you are going coast to coast. It's rough. Well, and I I feel like a lot of people are like, well, it's no different than going to Maryland. I feel like it's way different. I feel like going... It's one time zone. From, yeah. Exactly. F- going from Nebraska, like the Midwest, and then you... What about Maryland going to, to Washington? Exactly. Like, let's going talk across about the country. That. What is going if you, on If there? you really want a real-life example of how this has really screwed somebody, a couple weeks ago... Rutgers and USC played a Friday night football game. It was the lead out to Fox's World Series coverage. It was it was game one. So the game wasn't even supposed to start until 8 o'clock local time. So that's 8 o'clock Los Angeles time. That's 11 p.m. Eastern time from where Rutgers is from. So not only do they have to go from Piscataway, which is basically New York, to Los Angeles... So that's a three. That's three hours time zone change for them. Their bodies are basically starting the football game at 11 p.m. at night, and, and you're pretty much playing till 2 a.m. Yeah, and that's like, and like that's the effects that it's having on football. And like they play a game a week, whereas volleyball and these other sports, you're seeing two games like within three days. I and can't imagine. yeah, these football teams are given. A week at a time mm-hmm. to readjust, and granted, they it's not like they fly out there Monday before yeah, the Saturday game. It's still not a good but situation. The yeah, I I would agree. I yeah. think football was the main concern. Mm-hmm. And they're like these student athletes will be fine. I actually saw this TikTok, <laughs> loving talking about TikTok today. This girl was like, "Oh, you don't think I deserve an extension on my paper?" She was like a student athlete. She's like, "I got home at 3 a.m. last night from the bus ride from wherever they were, and had to go- wake up and go to class at eight, and then I had practice at 10. So yeah, I do think I deserve an extension. It's and crazy. I think we forget." that they're students like especially with nil and everything that's come on they still have to go to class they still have to do assignments imagine they're in their hotel room at 
8 p.m. before a game, before their 9.30 game now, apparently. Oh, I'm going to work on my mass media law homework. Yeah. Just give me a sec. Like, like they're only playing volleyball because they're getting a degree. Right. Like, we do I feel forget like, that. And like, that's why they're here in the end. Like, yes, I'm sure volleyball is, plays a bigger part in where they go to, right. but like, they're only at this school to get their degree. And I think Nebraska's maybe a little different to we forget that so much is because we send a lot of volleyball players to the to the next level. Mm-hmm. So that's true. Does Mayor Beeson have the oppor- is she going to have the opportunity to graduate and then go play volleyball at the next level and probably not work a traditional job? Yeah. What about some of the smaller schools or mm-hmm. some of the school like Northwestern? You know, we just swept them. They're on the bottom of the Big Ten. Most of those girls are there. For school, and then they just play volleyball. But yeah. they still have to, like, prioritize volleyball. And then imagine, oh, I need to actually get an internship to get experience for mm-hmm. my resume. When are you going to do that? When? Not when you're traveling <laughs> to Washington for a 930 game. I'll tell you that. <laughs> exactly. You can't get over the 930 <laughs> local start. <laughs> That's the 930 crazy. central. It's a 730 local start, but still. No. Like, I'm sorry, as a student, I want to. I wouldn't want to go. No. Like, I have some class the next day. I, and, like, I would <laughs> not survive. I hate to break the news to you, but uh, television is king. <laughs> yeah. Hate to tell you. That is why the game's starting at 9 30 p.m. on Big Ten. I fully I understand. But it's I all about don't want money. to. I don't you don't have to. to. <laughs> that's the reality. But anyway, let's we got it off on a bit of a tangent. We <laughs> yeah, got, that's my bad. <laughs> come on, Olivia. Back to the rankings. But yeah, we got it. There's there's some things going on with these with these rankings. The top four remains the same. I still as, think Nebraska should have had more votes. As Apparently they were these two have were very shocked to see the top two and the numbers next to the names. Uh, you were too when I told yeah, you. I, I, I'm less shocked now. Um, Creighton and Stanford flip flop. So Creighton is now five. Stanford's now four. Wisconsin and Kansas they don't move. Purdue. Wisconsin didn't move either. That was like, like I get that Nebraska was ranked above them, but. Come on. Still a big game. Come on. Where's Texas at? Have they fallen Kansas out would, yet? By the way, fall. Kansas is 20 they're, they're, and They didn't fall. But Kansas is 20 and 1 and are behind a 17 and 5 Wisconsin. Yeah. That, Just so we know. That's why Kansas is saying. probably Kansas will probably win the Big 12 this year um at 20 and 1. What about K-State? K-State is not ranked right now. But as we roll on, Purdue is now number nine, so they bump up from eleven. SMU is finally in the top ten. Been a long, been long enough. Arizona State, Oregon is now twelve after their loss. Texas is now fifteen. Big fall. I that was quite the quite the drop. Sixteen or fifteen from nine. They just could not. I don't know if they were ill. I don't know what was going on, but. Listen to this. The last time Texas lost three in a row was 2011, and it was to Minnesota twice and then Florida. The last time they lost three in a row at home was 1994. So in my lifetime, I <laughs> Texas volleyball has never lost three in a row at home, and that was to Houston, Notre Dame, and Duke, which that was a different time in volleyball. But they they didn't lose a lot of talent. Like Asia O'Neill in the middle, yes, fine. That's going to suck. You get Reagan Rutherford through the transfer portal. Maddie Skinner's still there. Your freshman setter who won you a national championship is still there. What's going on, Jared Elliott? What's going on? Yeah. And their loss against Oklahoma was their third five set match. Like, they're taking. Texas has not won a game in five sets this year. They're taking them. Like, We're taking them to five. <laughs> <laughs> or sweet. <laughs> yeah. Let's not do Okay. Let, let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> no. Yeah. But. Was Oklahoma wasn't ranked, right? Mm-mm. No. So, Still not ranked. Missouri is the first thinking, team out. And yeah, and Missouri wasn't ranked either. Nope. Wow. Hard to believe, isn't it? No, unbelievable. <laughs> it's literally unbelievable. Lit early? Was, was Texas literally. A&M ranked? Literally. What? Was Texas A&M ranked? They're not right now. Nope. So, three, three unranked, unranked teams in a row. Pretty at home. crazy. Yeah. It just, it just does. It's kind of crazy to see it, but we fail to forget just how good of a playoff team Texas is. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, it, it doesn't I, matter <laughs> what happens to them in the regular. They season. they just need to win enough games to be able. They don't even need to host a regional. They just need to win enough games to get themselves into the tournament, and then we're gonna. I we're gonna see somebody new, someone yeah. we haven't seen yet this season, and maybe that's all part of the plan. 
Maybe they're like, hmm, be just good enough to right. say. <laughs> Jared, Jared Elliott is devising this plan as we do. <laughs> he, he's, he's in like, his office right now. Now he's, he's worried. Cause... Okay. That was maybe one too many losses. <laughs> how, how do I pull this back together? But, like, they have another freshman setter. They have some of the best setters in the country. I don't know. Maddie Skinner, I don't know what's going on over there. Down what's very, there. What's very strange is they're running a 6 2 now when they were running a 5 1 last year. Did you know? <laughs> oh, do tell, do do enlighten me. Nobody has. I don't want to be wrong. Nobody has ever won a national championship running a six-two, except once, and I believe it was Wisconsin. But <laughs> as the eye twitch goes, yeah. But what? That's that. You don't. If you no one. If no one can do it, why does Jared Elliott think he can do it? I don't. I just think he may be recruited too well. I think he's got too many good players. He doesn't want to sit like them and let maybe some other people shine. So he's trying to kind of even the playing field, and that seems to be biting him in the butt a little bit. Well, and my problem is when you're a good team, you're going to have a lot of depth. You're going to have a lot of good players, good transfers. The reality is, is you can't always appeal to all of them. Like They have to come in knowing what they're going to get. Nebraska has a ton of depth, and you see girls not playing who are really good or not getting a playing time. Like, you can take Allie Batenhorst. She didn't get a ton of playing time last year. And Until the end of the season. Yeah, but now she's Crazy Big Ten Player of the Week at USC. Like, it just kind of is the way it is sometimes. You can't – I don't know. Can't appease everybody. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you. we saw all the people he got in the transfer portal. Whitney Lonstein, which – Welcome back, old friend. And then Reagan Rutherford. And every time I was like, no way they're going to Texas. Who's Who are they going to play instead of? Jenna Wenis is still there. Maddie Skinner's still there. I don't know what Whitney Longstein thought she was going to do there. I was like, I, who told them they were going to play? Because I'm telling them they're not going to play. And then he's trying to play everybody. And it's like, obviously not working. I don't know. That's how you can't get into a groove. No one can find any kind of consistency because they're not seeing consistent playing time. And when things start breaking, that's when you start losing the locker room. Yeah, well, and if, if say, okay, I'm going to use John Cook as an example. Hypothetical time. He, he plays Taylor Landfair. She starts not performing at what he expects. He puts Lindsey Krause in, vice versa, whatever. Jared Elliott's playing everyone all at the same time. So there's nobody to come and be like, okay, clean up her mess now. Okay, pick up the slack. Okay, now let's try this. Instead, he's just, everyone's going out there and le- let's just see what works the best, you guys. He's, there's no real system where John Cook is very like, okay, you're done. Like, Krause, let's go. Taylor Lampert, let's go. Or Jared Elliott's like, well, I'm actually going to put in you for half the first set and then you for the second half and then maybe we'll see how... And I just feel like that's not working for the hitters. From a hitting perspective, having that much inconsistency with your setter, whether that be Ellis Wendell or Avery Carlson, and if they're setting from their feet, if they're jump setting, it's very hard to get acclimated with and adjusted to and when you go into these games and you're forced to play more than three sets i just i can see how that would cause problems it's like trying to play in an all on an all-star team for volleyball and you've got like all of these really good players and like how do i get all these people in and try and like you know you everyone's got a great ta- everyone's a great talent like, I'm just thinking like 16 year olds playing playing in a in a tournament in some prestigious place. <laughs> like you're trying to get everyone in there because you know they can do well, but you can't play everyone or else you're not gonna be able to do anything. That's kind of what this what this situation feels like is you've got all these uber talented players on your team, much like Nebraska, but they're trying to make everybody you you just can't do that. You have to play who's gonna win. Like at but the, that, but that's the thing though is that everybody can win. But they're not right but now. They're not. <laughs> so it's like you everybody have to find, can win, but they're not. You have to find the setup and like the lineup to get those wins. And I think we've talked about throughout the season with John Cook, like the lineup hasn't always been the same. Like there's been inconsistencies, but his inconsistencies are like planned and deliberate. Like he's taking people out and putting people in as he's seeing like who's got the hot hand, whereas. It seems as though Texas is just like, ah, 
you go in, you go in, take you out. Like, it's just, like, jumbled. I, I feel like they can't find... Because, arguably, Nebraska has had those five, mm-hmm. six with Lexi, seven with Olivia, eight and a, seven and a half with Lainey, <laughs> that are, like, very consistent. You're mm-hmm. going to play. You know exactly what your position is. And then that's... What, what number was I at? Eight and a half? <laughs> a Taylor, Landfair, Lindsey, Krause is really that only piece yeah. that the has Scarlet been... Scarlet Fever math is hurting my brain. <laughs> math 203 didn't prepare me well for this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Taylor, Landfair, Lindsey, Krause is kind of the only one that has been in consistent. Yeah. Where, and that's an outside position. Yeah, that's a vital piece. of, But a setter? Yeah. Like how... That would be like if Bergen Riley was playing every other set. And then you get Kennedy or they're like, that's just not gonna work yeah and I think Jared Elliott honestly right now is sacrificing his team success to kind of to make everybody make happy. Yeah. happy and it's in the end everyone's gonna be a little bit less happy if you're losing true it's a good way to put it not much you can say to that I mean if you're not if you're not winning what are you doing right you're not happy I'll tell you that much <laughs> all right real quickly for for it's time to to wrap things up what does Nebraska volleyball have to do to be successful this weekend in the Pacific in the Pacific coast so for Oregon one thing that stands out for me their outside Mimi Collier is going to be their dominant swing the entire match they're gonna go to her in the front in the back they have a great setter and I think that's going to be something that's going to be tough. Now, the bounce back to Washington, whether they win or lose that game against Oregon, going and playing two days later against Washington is going to be very difficult. So they're going to need to be rested, hydrated, fueled, and kind of just be in a mindset like, hey, Annie Jackson actually said this really well. The game forgets. You know, you lose to Oregon, they don't, Washington, like that game, they don't know. So, like, it's not they don't know, they don't they, care. Not they. Not they being Washington. They being the game. The volleyball gods? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, like the game forgets it. In the grand scheme of things, a loss to Oregon would not kill this Nebraska season. And so, coming back from Oregon and going and playing hard against Washington, I think, is what's going to be telling. Yeah, and I think not only does the game forget, but taking a little line from like Ted Lasso, be a goldfish. Like, yeah, remember the things that you need to. <laughs> what? We went fishing. <laughs> oh, I was so confused. Like Dory. <laughs> um, obviously, don't forget the things that you need to change, but I have short term memory loss. Don't let the bad like vibes of losing the game way down a potential win you just have to know what you need to adjust and go from there my big thing is going to become in the second game first game is going to be probably business as usual yeah the time zone change is probably going to suck but and i feel like with the first game it's going to be like so quick i don't know if it the, like i feel like the second game would be harder with the time zone oh right? the, se- the second game will definitely be harder and it's it's going to be how they bounce back. Mm -hmm. We saw in a couple weeks ago when they had a back-to-back with Illinois and Michigan, it was at home, but Nebraska came out pretty slow and they lost the first set to Michigan. It was the first set we we talked about it during the game, Olivia and I, that it was the first set one loss they had since they got swept by SMU Mm -hmm. in early September. They just have to avoid coming out slow. And if they are going to come out slow, then they need to do it diligently because Washington's not going to care that you're coming out. So they're they're going to take advantage of it. And Washington has played too well this season to not be able to take advantage of it. They they are just they they are good enough. This is a a team that's probably going to end up in the tournament or come close to making the tournament. So they're going to know what to do. I mean, this is a caliber of team that they're not used to facing. In Nebraska, coming from the Pac-12, the Pac-12 really wasn't the the super a super strong volleyball conference. They had Stanford, and that was kind of about it for the most part. USC was always kind of there. Oregon was always kind of there. They're they're all having good seasons, but Washington's not really used to the, the type of competition that they're facing right now. And they've done well to start it out, but this is going to be a different animal that they're coming in to face. And a sleepy Nebraska team is less powerful than you might think and we've seen it enough times this year to where like 
okay, the second end of this back-to-back, for whatever reason they struggle with those, whether it's at home or on the road, and this is particularly this weekend, this is where they really have to be on top of their game with recovery and taking care of their bodies after the Oregon game. Yeah, and this Washington team, you know, we talked about how they just beat Oregon in five and then they lose to USC the next game one to th- three sets to one. They won one set, USC won three. That's how that works. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, it's been a long day. But Washington's got to play Minnesota and then at. Washington and then Nebraska will come. So also going to be a tough test for Washington to see how they bounce back. Minnesota takes a lot of teams to multiple sets and more than three, obviously multiple. And mm, yeah. um, so both teams are going to have to be fighting a little bit of fatigue, a little bit of tiredness, soreness. Washington does have that advantage. They can sleep in their own bed. They can eat their usual pregame meal and do their whole routine. So both teams going to have to fight a little bit on Sunday, Saturday to win that game. Yeah, and I think we've talked about like none no part of Nebraska's season has been necessarily easy, but Wisconsin kind of marks the part where it's like, okay, you're getting down and dirty now and Oregon and Washington are two really good teams we have ranked and then almost ranked. So, it's just going to be continuing on that and just getting things done. Nothing's easy from here on out for Nebraska. Yeah. You get Oregon and Washington. Minnesota comes in. Indiana's been good this year. Mm-hmm. Then you have to go to Iowa in the middle of the week. That presents its own challenges. That's Wisconsin week, by the way, as well. So Wisconsin's going to come in that weekend. Then you got to go to Penn State and to Maryland. Yeah. So it's the gauntlet, as we've been calling it. All all of the cupcakes have been eaten. Now you're fighting for scraps. <laughs> and Penn State undefeated in the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. That and they haven't played Wisconsin yet. Nope. So, but those that November twenty third, November 29th, Wisconsin, Penn State, that could be Big Ten deciding. Mm-hmm. Gear up. This is gear bit, up. This it's is going intense. to be fun. We had a fun show today. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> we happy birthday, Emma. <laughs> happy Thank birthday you. to Emma. You get to we get to just talk stuff. All good for an stuff. Hour. All good stuff. <laughs> Positive stuff. Positive, positive, positive stuff. Monday. Yes. Positive Monday. We need to have more of those. <laughs> wish, wish, happy, wish a happy birthday to our good friend Emma <laughs> when you can because she deserves it. Uh, we will have another midweek show coming up on Wednesday. Basketball season is back. So we'll get into that on Wednesday. We might do a little bit more volleyball and we'll let these two sign off on their football thoughts for a little while as well because. I know they got plenty of them. Um, thank you both for stopping in. Good show today. Oh, yeah, thank thanks. You. Thanks for getting through that one with me. That was <laughs> something. That, that was something. We're going to go uh, put some eardrops in from the Screaming Kids. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for listening on Spotify or Apple on your favorite devices. Till we see you next time. Thank you for listening to Scarlet Fever. We'll see you next time.